And now are you, would you lean more toward a vaccination or a remedy as it, if it were another type of viral disease that you deal with, that we deal with? Well, I mean, God, for the acute cases, obviously the remedy for, but, but to, to, to end this whole thing, um, you know, a, a vaccination to me is, is uh, what officially ends this. Welcome to the show, Chuck. You know, we appreciate, you know, as a group and, you know, in a broader base, what you're doing. Um, you know, as you know, we're going through hell of times right now. And um, there's a lot of people out there just going through transition, whether it be personally having to stay at home, whether it's watching people on TV, just going through it on the front lines. And just wanted to thank you for t- taking the time out and coming out to, to see us here. And uh, first, you know, introduce yourself uh, so the audience can see, you know, who you are and what you're about and what you're doing on the front lines. Sounds good. Well, uh, um, so my name's Chuck Gabbard, as, as you guys know, and um, uh, I am a Notre Dame grad, uh, class of 2001, <clears throat> and I've had kind of made my travels throughout the U.S. and in my training and, and whatnot, but I finally found a home um, as a gastroenterologist with the Oregon Clinic in Portland, Oregon. Um, I went to med school out here. Um, uh, so I've been out here now for a few years, and um, I basically do a lot of endoscopy, um, especially for people, um, inpatient stuff. I do a lot of higher risk endoscopy. So I'm at one of the, the major, uh, uh, tertiary referral centers in Portland that, um, I end up kind of dealing with a lot of these patients. I think we're kind of one of the hospitals with maybe, maybe the most patients currently or were in Oregon for some, some time, but, um, the university as well, um, obviously, but, um, but yeah, so that's kind of my role is I'm an endoscopist and uh, luckily, you know, my, my exposure has been nothing compared to, to, you know, some of the frontline people, ER physicians, ICU physicians, pulmonologists who are, you know, sitting there, intub- anesthesiologists, people are intubating these people and, you know, coming in, in, clutch, in such close proximity to droplets and whatnot that, you know, for me, I'm considering myself even blessed doing an endoscopy, you know, one foot away. So um uh but that's kind of my role i'm i'm honored to be a, a part of this i'm honored to be a part of the healthcare field right now you know it's a um it's a crazy time and um i'm just happy to know that whatever role that i can serve uh from what i i'm capable of you know um i'll give that my my all so um i'm proud to be part of this guys i really appreciate what you guys are doing i think i think it's sweet and um uh yeah so um oregon luckily has been in a pretty good uh, position lately um, at least on the West Coast, kind of we've we've mirrored those that are, um, you know, Washington, California, where maybe our progress has been a little uh, better, or, or I don't know, I don't know if that's the right word, our progress, but um, you know, our, our we've eased into it um, in comparison to the coast in some places. So uh, for it's been uh, you know, it's a gradual learning process, and and I, I just hope everyone stays safe, and and we we do what we can to to kind of get through this. So Chuck, how's how's your workload right now? So our workload is is really diminished. We, um, you know, basically are only doing emergent uh, procedures or urgent procedures. That actually just started to open up. Governor Kate Brown opened up um, uh, May one, doing more elective and and non urgent or more kind of semi urgent uh, procedures. So so things will kind of pick up again, um, I think in May. But but workload, I think across the board for for people is um, you know, it's, it's highly variable. Um, I know that some people in the urgent care ER settings that are just getting crushed and, and, um, you know, other people that, that, that can't find a patient to do, um, you know, can't, can't find a patient to see. So, um, yeah, I think it goes both ways right now. Something yeah, I heard a lot of people are kind of staying home and skipping that, um, uh, skipping procedures and that there's going to kind of be a, I don't know, some, some, uh, I want to call it, I, I guess, unintended consequences of, of closing stuff down that um, might not be good for people's health for other reasons. Yeah, you, you bring up a great point. There was a there was a recent little, I think it was an editorial in the New England Journal, um, just to that very point, um, saying that maybe in the end, um, you know, more people will get affect. The most people affected by this will be those with non-COVID related illnesses that you know, are pushed off or, or, you know, they don't get a biopsy early enough for some reason, or, 
or an intervention, you know, that would have otherwise been maybe yeah. taking place in a cath lab, uh, that those patients may be the ones who suffer most. And, and it'll be really interesting to see if that's true. I, I, you know, we're rolling the dice right now with patients that we consider urgent or um, emergent. Um, well, we know emergent, but urgent or semi-urgent or maybe even elective. Um, we're rolling the dice on this definitely, and, and it feels a little uncomfortable at times, but I think you're right. I think there's going to be a lot of patients where maybe in the end that delay is going to, going to be impactful. You're being really humble about it, but also you've got to think there's a lot of people that are just kind of out of fear choosing not to, they like ignoring totally. symptoms, right? And, they, and choosing to just to, to, to hold out as long as they can to be totally. out of fear or whatever. So that's, I think there's that factor too. Totally. And, and I think that's, that too has kind of, well, there's a lot of factors, obviously, but virtual, you know, telemedicine now is huge. Um, one month ago, no one knew what we're doing right now, getting on Zoom, talking face to face in real time. You can tell me how you feel, your stomach hurts, you can point it out, I can order a test for you, I don't have to see you. Um, now, granted, is it ideal? Uh, right now, it is maybe, but, but um, in the future, I don't know. I mean, it's always nice to see someone in person and, and, and do an exam and, and, and do that. But boy, right now, I mean, virtual telemedicine for that very reason, people don't want to be exposed to anything. They want to stay at home, but they have complaints and they have needs. So, so that's, that's been a huge thing now. And I think, uh, I don't know that it'll go anywhere, but um, hopefully we can all figure out a way to make it work and blend with, with different, you know, practice and, and, and how they run their practices and, and whatnot. But right. And um, what, what treatments have you seen that have transitioned you to, I mean, I hate to utilize the term flat and a curve, but, you know, as you've seen things flow down in terms of the influx, what things have you guys done or seen that have been helpful? Shoot, man. I mean, I think uh, uh, the early action sheltering place, that has probably been very impactful um I, I i think it's mainly social stuff trev I, I i medical management as you know is pretty uh there isn't much right now other than supportive care and, and attempts at using some medicines that we hope might might help but um i think anything preventative you can do with but you know stay six feet away from people and good hand hygiene i mean shoot man i wash my hands like 30 times a day now and and uh I, it's a little attic and, and I never did that before, but I'll probably now forever. And, um, uh, it's kind of a, I think those, th those personal, uh, things that you can do to, to protect yourself and your family, that's, that's probably what's flattening the curve most and at least making it tolerable out here, uh, for, for our hospital. I'll write it. Is the, is the handshake dead? Boy, boy, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw an elbow or two out, or uh, you know, one of these, you know, you know I don't know. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm a big fan of giving uncomfortable hugs, and I like the idea that those hugs are gonna be even more uncomfortable now. So <laughs> really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, or you can go the hunt hand over. There it is. Maybe <laughs> hand over yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. It's a perfect time for uh, you know gerbophobes or those with OCD to like just feel a little more normal. It's, it's one, of, one yeah. of the silver linings. Totally. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Seriously, um, let's uh, let's talk let's talk Notre Dame stories. Well, actually, so before we get there, let's make sure we're we're highlighting a cause. Are you are you is there a, a cause that you would like us to highlight on the show to see if we can drive some support towards? Well, shoot. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, as a physician with the Oregon Clinic, we're kind of one of the big organizations in Portland or, or actually all of Oregon and, and Southwest Washington. And, and, you know, we work very closely with Providence uh, um, Health System out here and, and uh, get our, our, our finger and, and our, our feet in different little areas there and, and make some meaningful contributions, you know, uh, uh, from volunteer opportunities and whatnot and, and get colon cancer nets, all sorts of stuff. So, I think, you know, we're so busy doing all that other stuff. And I know the Notre Dame Club of Portland is very active. Um, all these organizations are super great in our community. And uh, I know they, they work even with, with St. Francis, uh, which is an a, a organization in Southeast Portland that, that does a lot of great homeless work. And, and so um, all these places, I just say, oh, man, they're, they're kind of all my people out here. And, and um, I'm happy to, to point the end one, one way or the other. I just love what you guys are doing. I hope you guys keep doing this with all sorts of different people. And, 
um, uh, it's really, really cool. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, well, we, we want to drive some attention locally and then also, you know, from the wider Notre Dame community and, you know, see the different ways we can impact, whether it's raising some money or maybe it's, in, uh, you know, getting someone locally motivated or aware of some cause that they can, they're like, you know, turn those on a light bulb in their mind and they can come up with something new to, to, to contribute, you know, right. who knows, we'll see. Hopefully we can make some kind of impact. I will, we'll see what kind of audience we can grow. Oh, totally. well, you know, the cool thing is just, you know, seeing the folks that we went to school with and all the great work that they're doing, you know, talking to Pete Rock, he's working with the Boston Fed, you know, speaking with Teasdale, he's working with small businesses, getting them loans during a crucial time. Um, and it's crazy because, you know, all of the other stories that we can share are fun, but it's, it's great to see how we've transitioned to still hold that true to experiences that we have, but just, you know, especially now needed more than ever, just seeing the great work that folks are doing on the front lines. It's, it's an honor, an honor. No, I'll tell you, I mean, we're, we're pretty fortunate to, to be around a lot of good people. So uh, uh, even, even the crazy folks turned out to be good people. So <laughs> okay, you know, we're, fine. We're, we're, we're doing fine. Absolutely, and generates for good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, um, what do you got behind you, Chuck? What do you got? What? Yeah. What's what's the what's your shirt? What do you got? This is, my, this is my Dexter Williams shirt, man. This this is <laughs> this is uh, this oh, man. I was waiting for that. It. When he got that first touch. I knew it. I said, oh, <laughs> Yeah, to the house. I go watch this, and and I think five people <laughs> just watch him take it to the house. Oh, and, uh, so this is my guy right here. That's nice. This nice. Is he? He's on the Ravens? Oh, the, Packers. Right? the Packers. The Packers. Packers. Yeah. That's right. That's Drafted right. fourth round, right? Third or fourth yeah. round? Yeah, it might have been deeper than that, but I don't know. He, I don't know if he's played a lot, but but uh, whatever. He's, he's hanging he's, in there, though. Yeah. yeah he's, he's, he's getting on the hey, field. He's getting a roster check. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he is. Hopefully, we're <laughs> getting one. Uh, I got an old green Montana here. Oh, nice. Oh, All right. And that's then we got this one, which is pretty cool. I don't know where I got that. That's an old Ross Browner oh, DX nice. Stein. I don't know where I got that one, but that one's pretty. Uh, that one's a good one too. So, nice. you still got my Rakai jersey? Ella. Uh, I do have your Rakai jersey. <laughs> I, got some, I almost wore that for this. I should have worn that. <laughs> I'll get that to you, T Dog. I promise. I'll get that to I, you. I left, I left it at Chuck's place in Pittsburgh and uh, yeah, I'll get that to you. many years ago. <laughs> Finders keepers in that situation. You gotta, you gotta go back and pick it up. The five-year rule. It's been yeah. in my house for five years. It's technically <laughs> mine. Well, I want Maddie. I want that Golden Tate jersey. I was telling you, that. I want that. <laughs> it's like you, you better not let me. Don't, don't invite me to your house, man. I'll say, uh, that thing's gone. We'll, we'll have to get you another one. Back, back when, um, back when I was living with Dave in uh in Tennessee for that little brief time, we we um Golden was a high school senior at Hendersonville, which was the city next to Gallatin where we were living. So, wow. Uh, so we became fans early. We were excited to see him go to Notre Dame, yeah. that's for sure. And then uh, he carried on a lot of the um, the good hands traditions that I feel like yeah. Dave instilled on everybody. So, and yeah. it's fun. It's fun because I see him on social media and stuff like talking about got to throw and catch everything. And then today he was on Instagram and he was, or maybe yesterday he was holding his baby in one hand and making one hand catches with the other one. <laughs> and it was it was. I was like, good, nice to see the influence. I swear, I'm like, whether or not that's the real credit, I'm giving Dave credit for that influence on uh, all the just like throwing and catching everything. That's why I remember a good chunk of uh, my college experience. He just threw shit all over the house and all over the dorms and parties and in the classroom even. Uh, those are the days. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of those are the days, you got any Notre Dame stories that you feel like sharing on today's show with us? <laughs> Oh man, I, I, I just dirt. we always love trying to get dirt on Trevor. We've, we've <laughs> no dirt per se. We've we've gotten some uh, some good stories though for sure. You know, if we're talking football and you're talking Trevor, there's only there's only there's one story that can probably be pretty PG. Actually, <laughs> is is an inner hall story of Trevor uh, <laughs> that that you know it, no one will ever forget, and uh, it's pretty legendary. We. Uh, you know, Trevor's Trevor's favorite line was on every was an Interhall game Sunday, right, Trevor? Yes. Yeah. So Trevor's favorite line Saturday night was, "Oh man, it's sad. I got Interhall tomorrow. I can't be going out. I, I gotta be. I gotta be good. I, I, I gotta. I'm gonna turn it early tonight." 
<laughs> 2 a.m. rolls around, 3 a.m. rolls around, Trevor's still <laughs> doing it, you know, he's still hooting and hollering. And, and so the next day, he has a big inner hall game and a bunch of us go. And, and I think Sean Kane, uh, his parents were there. And I think a few, I th- we had a good crew. There to watch JPW, Trevor. Junior Parents Weekend. I think it was uh, Junior Parents Weekend, wow. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Trevor, okay, let me get this right. So Trevor strips a guy at like the 20 yard line, or no, like the 10 yard line of, of like they're about to score. And he, Trevor's on defense, he strips him. He, then he recovers the ball. Then he takes it 80 yards and like the whole place, Trevor. And he gets shot right at like the five yard <laughs> line by the guy. <laughs> he just runs out of gas. And the guy gets up. <laughs> I can't remember if you fumbled it, Trevor, but it didn't matter because I just see him run off the side of the field. His helmet comes off, and I just see Trevor. Reversal of fortune. <laughs> oh, reversal of last night's fortune. All on the side of the, uh, the side of the field. It, it was pretty great. And you know who that was who stripped me? No. Pete Rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It was Pete Rock. So, yeah. Adam and I were order. full circle. Full Adam circle. and I were in Siegfried Hall, and so that was Siegfried. That was a Siegfried versus uh, Sword yeah, and battle, and Pete was our hero from those dorm games. Uh, well, there was another one. He used to he the thing that Pete used to always do. Uh, uh, you know, while we're talking about dorm football, I'm just thinking about this. <laughs> He used to, you know, so he was, so he was, this kid, he was the, he was the safety, the free safety on defense. He was like a tight end kind of split end kind of something gadget player on offense. And <laughs> he was the place kicker for the kickoffs and the, and the, and the, and the, and the field goals and the extra points. And he was the punter on special teams for punting too. <laughs> and he was legit good at these things. Like I, I, told, I think I called Malik Zaire on the, when we were interviewing with him, like, he was the he he had the best punt and the best kick at the tryout when the, when they used to try out the uh, for the Notre Dame team. He had the like the the most the farthest kick the farthest punt like he was dominating this tryout multiple years. <laughs> we were sure that they actually were not uh, that they were not like going to hire or not, not going to give anybody a scholarship. And Especially then they going up against Kevin Kopka. Come on, man. Yeah, Kevin Kopka. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, I think now I remember. I think it was was it David Ruffin was the one guy from some from Siegfried who actually got signed to the team from that competition later on. So maybe they proved me wrong that they actually did give someone a scholarship that actually made the team. But, but anyway, back to my, my story that's derailed. Pete used to on punts, he would punt it and he would, he would knew we were watching the sideline. And there's this like kind of moment when like, it was a fair catch or whatever that like the team stopped, the, the whistle has not blown and you're supposed to play whistle to whistle. But a lot of the people have kind of led up because the guy's fair catching and like, no one's doing shit. And Pete would look for the person that was like turned the other way, not looking at the <laughs> ball go, and just boom, <laughs> light uh, him up. I mean, in today, you know, now we know about co- concussions and stuff. <laughs> not, I don't feel as good like laughing about it because it was probably not the safest thing, you know, in terms of collisions on a football field. But oh my God, it was so much entertainment. Everybody became, everybody knew this was his play. We would all look out for it. Like, uh, the you know the different football players would come watch him play because they were waiting for the just the target. Like somebody up on it. <laughs> yeah. Now that's it. Usually you, know, you get thrown out of the game for that. But back yeah. at dorm football, he never got a penalty for it. It was, yeah. it was great. well. After that, I used to love watching him play lacrosse too because like he'd be running down the running down the field like racing somebody for the ball supposedly, but the other guy's going for the ball and Pete's gonna take the body like a hundred percent when he goes down to pick up the ball. Oh, he's the best. He was the same at the life. party that night. You know, probably at that party the night before, he was also taking the body. Yes. You know, yes. the dude, on the field and off the field. Yes. <laughs> there was collusion. There was collusion before the game, for yeah, sure. Nice. Um, let's, let's get back to, um, to, to, to the more poignant stuff, to COVID-19. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting. Like, do you, how are you guys on supplies? Do you, see, do you foresee yourself getting to a – to a, a, a concerned place of overload at this point? I mean, are we, are we worried about a second wave? Are we feeling good where we are with supplies? Um, yeah, I mean, there? I think people, people, I, I think, well, out here in the Pacific Northwest, I feel like our supply chain's been um, uh, pretty good. And I think right now we've, you know, 
hospital can estimate 60 to, to 90 days worth of supplies and, and uh, uh, make sure that that's adequate. And um, I think, you know, smaller places, surgery centers, um, uh, urgent cares, those kind of things I, I, are a question mark. And um, hopefully the, the answer is that they're in the same situation. But yeah, I think it's less of an issue, at least PPE wise out here uh, currently, and, and hopefully for any second wave, at least preparation now, you, you know, you, you had a warning shot, um, and, and with a second wave, um, you know, you just got to be as prepared as you can and to have that, right. you know, amount of days ahead of you that you do have PPEs, well, then that's probably, um, probably going to be fine. But yeah, right now it feels pretty good out here. I do, I do cases now. I, I didn't even used to wear a mask on my face at all for any cases. Um, now I wear an abundance of, uh, you know, an N95 and, and, and they have sort of the shield thing uh, as well for any procedure for the theoretic aerosolization of, of coronavirus. But, right. um, but yeah, so, so I feel like the amount of PPE is pretty sufficient. I don't know how it is. I think in New York, it's probably getting now uh, uh, stabilized from a, from a, a little better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know initially that was a, that was the big concern and um, uh, things look to be improving there too, but hopefully, yeah, with any second wave, which of course I'm, I'm pretty worried about, um, especially in the midst of, you know, a flu season that is highly unpredictable every year. Um, you know, what's going to happen? What, what can you support that? And, um, you know, there's still a lot of question marks and I think that that's what makes all this a little bit more, more uneasy too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, so what, well, what I was going to say it's, it's been, not, it's, it's not, it's not more than anecdotal, I guess, but hearing the, hearing the, the variation from us doing the show, and talking to a couple of different doctors and, it, and not trying to like drive a certain narrative at all, you know, but knowing that a lot of the media we watch is trying to drive certain narratives. It's been, it's been refreshing to hear a variety of opinions and a variety of situations from, from Dr. Hooley, who was in New York and sound like she was like in the epicenter yeah. and going through and, and a new, a new doctor herself and, and really being run through the ringer, so to speak, you know, and having to reuse, masks and find you know be creative and get around it to to like out here in california with we had talked to dr burchett who like was kind of the calm before the storm moment a little bit you know where they were kind of like the, the 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 traffic had died down so much um from the stuff we were talking about earlier about people you know staying home or uh, avoiding elective procedures and that kind of stuff um that i don't know it's been nice to hear a variety whereas it seems like when you watch the news you get kind of painted the same kind of picture or whatever Totally. Yeah, it's real. Uh, everything you watch is super dismal. And I, you know, of course, I love to focus on New York, which, um, you know, that that situation was just, I think, so dramatically different than than the vast majority of places in America from, you know, a healthcare perspective, um, uh, you know, a, a density perspective, yes. uh, how do you get how do you get to work perspective. And, and um, so, yeah, I think it's just very different. And I don't know if it's, you know, completely 100% applicable to, you know, all other places. But yeah, it's, we've certainly had a, a, a better experience if there is one um, in Oregon here. Um, but that's, again, you know, people have really done their part and, and, and places are ghost town. I mean, it's, it's, uh, people are, have, have done their part. So, but I think now people are kind of anxious to see, you know, hey, what can we slowly do to, to get back into, into the swing of things? And, and uh, yeah, I think at that point now, that's probably the next discussion is how do we get, how do we get that ball uh, uh, rolling effectively? Uh, I think that from what I've heard and what we've heard collectively is just testing. How are you guys doing on testing out by in your area? Yeah, I think we, we, we've we done more, to, we did more today, I read, than, than uh, uh, we have um, for any one day, you know, since this whole outbreak and it continues to kind of increase. And I know you know, testing's been reserved for a, a certain population of people that meet meet certain criteria, and and um, you know it's probably the right thing um, when you're limited in that regard. Um, but I think over time, you know, well, let's see what happens. Hopefully, rapid testing becomes available. I think that would be a complete yeah. game changer. Is is something that could give you a result within five minutes or 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 or, or sooner, um, which you know that's being talked about. And I think if you if you have that capability and all of a sudden you can, you can really open things up and, and screen people quickly um, if they need to be, um, you know, if they fit your, your criteria or whatever. And now are you, would you lean more toward a vaccination or a remedy as it, if it were another type of viral disease that you deal with, that we deal with? Well, I mean, God, 
for the acute cases, obviously the remedy for, but, but to, to, to end this whole thing, um, you know, a, a vaccination to me is, is uh, what officially ends this, um, or at least one that we know would be effective, which we hope that it would be um, uh, based on the, you know, animal models and, and, and what they can achieve over a short period of time. Um, in, in understanding, you know, your immunity from from a vaccination, but uh, to me, I think if it's uh, if it's if it's possible to just get it over with and vaccinate, boy, that's that's huge. But yeah, obviously, right now there's thousands of people that could benefit from acute therapy, and, and there will be in the future. So yeah, it'd be nice to have some be nice to have some something that would work for the acute term as well. Do you um do you have any fear that um, a vaccine is just something that uh, Bill Gates is trying to put together to lower the population? <laughs> I don't know, man. But if he does it, but you know, I don't know. This is <laughs> that's one of my favorite conspiracy theories going around <laughs> lately. Is that this is all part of Bill Gates' master plan to lower population? Seems like quite a well, convoluted way to go about doing that. Well, the thing is with Bill Gates, he's not even in health field. He's you know he's Microsoft. <laughs> he's not a he's not a doctor not anymore he's stepped down officially from microsoft yeah, yeah he's 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 more like um rockefeller advisor, these right? days. yeah he's, yeah. <laughs> he's just trying to put his money where the where it's profitable i think you're so back now. one thing i've been curious about is just uh looks like from the statistics a lot more men are dying from from coronavirus proportionally um what, can you explain that at all you know i think uh, it, that's a tough one to explain and, and certainly one that that I you know will be looked at I know uh, you know as this goes on and on and, and I think that one area that's been is that men have more comorbidities in the area where COVID-19 as a disease really starts to, to get you you know those of of uh, hypertension heart disease uh, diabetes um, especially maybe those that are a little less under control or, or, or less optimized I think we know kind of overall that uh, that you know, women do probably a better job of taking care of themselves in most cases. But, uh, <laughs> but no, I think, I think, and in, in a, in a lot of the, 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 the studies too in Asia where, you know, a lot of the, the men were smokers. I mean, a lot of them were smokers. And, and so um, I think you're seeing there that, that there is a, a male, you know, predominance, but I think due to the other stuff that they kind of carry with that, those other comorbidities and smoking. But yeah, I think it, uh, you know, time will tell if it's certainly a, a, a really preferential independent of those cofactors you know yeah. is this a male uh, a predominated thing and boy yeah it certainly seems to be that maybe there could be something there uh, but we'll see uh, yeah that that, that cofactor thing i mean definitely seems like a very you know reasonable explanation um because the the, the percentage of, of people who are dying from this looks like it's really really high for people that have comorbidities right right Right. Yep. The elderly with comorbidities and, and, and um, especially I think vascular stuff that probably, you know, what, what we're, what I think people anecdotally are seeing as well is kind of people on certain types of maybe medications or this uh, uh, um, a certain type of um, uh, uh, cellular protein that might be involved where um, uh, like an ACE inhibitor or, or things like that, that might affect a certain cascade of events where, where maybe this disease is a lot more, you know, serious in those patients. And, and um, yeah, I think it's just so unknown now, but, but I, I imagine by the second wave, we'll have a much better idea. If there is a second wave, hopefully there is a, hopefully it just goes away uh, like SARS-1, um, which would be fantastic. But um, um, at least hopefully we'll have a little more guidance for them, for that, for that to, when that happens. But. A little more prepared. Yeah. Um, out, outside of um, of you know COVID nineteen and coronavirus, but inside of your specialty, are there are there any advice you'd give to audience in terms of stuff we can do to be healthier or to to take better care of ourselves from what you see as a doctor in, in your um, daily practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I think really now is 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 to 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 give people their space and 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 uh, really really maintain good hygiene and I think um, uh, you know it's it, it's really hard and I was thinking about this on my way home the other day from the hospital as I, was, I had an itch on my face which had been going on all day and of course I didn't want to touch it with my gloves or my mask or even after washing or whatever and so you have this itch that keeps coming back underneath your mask or whatever and on your as you're driving home it's still kind of there and you're just wanting to touch it but my wife and I have this huge decontamination protocol that I've got to go through first and I realized what a difference maker it is like to not touch your face because for me, I've, I'm always, you know, 
oh, I have glasses, I touch my glasses, I, I you know, I, I'm always fidgeting. And mm -hmm. now I've got to think about that. And I think that is one thing that maybe we can do to protect ourselves um, other than the hand washing, but, but really, you know, don't just, as you're going up to, whoa, no, don't touch my face or my hands clean. And uh, that might be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, so, so it sounds like you're, you almost expect that incidents of other diseases yeah, might go right. down. As yeah, right. Right. Incidents of what? Like other diseases like cold, flu, like uh, yeah. all infectious. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I hope our, I hope everyone's ready. Those goes down just generally speaking with new hygiene, you know, uh, uh, behaviors. You know, I don't know because generally speaking, you know, okay. the virus is, is is easily destructible with with uh, 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 soap and 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 alcohol based hand solutions. So so a lot of these viruses are they're very weak. They have uh, they can't handle disruption like that. And and so uh, uh, for me, it's just I'm just going to be neurotic about it. And I think that's the best I can do. You know, what about moving past? Um like coronavirus, just like, let's say before coronavirus, just in your general practice, is there certain re repeating stuff you see coming in or any certain advice that you give based on patients you you're normally seeing? Oh, give me a kiss. Mwah. Good night. I love you. Good yeah. <laughs> night, buddy. Um, I guess I was just like kind of from a, you know, you're a doctor who sees all these patients and yeah. we're, we're used to talking to people about coronavirus and, you know, yep. we've, we're hearing a lot of the, the different ways to protect ourselves, but you know, out, outside of coronavirus, we still have all these different things that we're dealing with as a, excuse me, as a society yeah. um, that affect our health and health in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Like, I don't know if there's anything that like in your normal practice that you're seeing or anything that you like in terms of diet or exercise or yeah. if there's anything that like really stands out that you're seeing a lot of or that you recommend that you, to a lot of patients to do or anything like that. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, just to kind of reiterate what I do, I, I mainly do interventional gastroenterology. So I do a lot of what's called endoscopic ultrasound or ERCPs. So bile duct pancreas sampling, uh, you know, cyst drainages, um, uh, like big, big colon polyps that don't want to take off. And I'll, I'll, I'll give it a whirl before surgery is entertained. And um, so that's kind of what I do. I I do see a lot of general gastroenterology patients, so you know the the your 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 normal folks that bloated and and in pain and nauseous, vomiting, loose stool, whatever. Right. Um, and I think we're trying to get better at using um, adjunct therapies rather than medical management for some of these patients with chronic GI symptoms, where you know you haven't really found anything that you know could benefit from an exact medicine that you know would take care of it, and so. Um, uh, you know, I think from an irritable bowel perspective, which we see a lot of those patients, everyone in gastroenterology does, um, uh, I th uh, people are having heightened symptoms right now because anxiety certainly plays a role in the development of these symptoms and whatnot. But right. I think learning about different diets, being in Portland, Oregon is a really progressive place to do that. Um, you know, acupuncture, all sorts of different things that, that might be a benefit for these patients. So for me, I'm learning about all that. I think it's super cool. Um, I was previously at the University of Arizona before here at Banner Health and, and, and University in Phoenix, and then prior to that in, in, in Pittsburgh at UPMC. And so um, I, I haven't got, you know, I didn't get to see the, the kind of the, the Oregon approach towards, towards medicine, which is a little, a little different than, than most. But right. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a learning experience for me too. And, uh, but yeah, the, this COVID vi coronavirus is changing everything. It's, it's changing the way kind of we're doing things. You know, now we have all these different protocols with how we wait and, and, and after a scope, we wait for 20 minutes while the air particles are filtered, you know, so that when you open the door, they don't exit the door. Um, it, it's a big difference in virtual telemedicine, like I said, telemedicine, it's just a, a crazy time. And, and um, uh, we'll see how much of this lasts and, and, and how much of it's, um, hopefully we can get returned to normal, you know, to some degree. Now my, my approach has been to, keep the virus and other things away to like alternate between brown liquor one night and then clear <laughs> liquor the next night. And, uh, but that might not be good for my tummy in some ways. Um, <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, and, and definitely don't inhale that in your lungs. You definitely don't want to have it. <laughs> don't yeah. inject it either. Yeah, yeah no <laughs> injection. <laughs> I, I prefer the Lysol. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've yeah. been trying to find a way to get that UV light inside of me as <laughs> recently. <laughs> I feel like that's the good thing about skin though, was like the skin protects the UV light from like totally decaying your body from the inside. But I don't know. What do I know? I'm no scientist. <laughs> that's not <laughs> a big science. 
I'm a GI doctor. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, this has been great. Be you, man. Trust me. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> this has been great, dude. It's been so good catching up with you and learning a little bit about, um, you know, what you're doing out there. And it's been great getting a different perspective from different places in the country, people that are qualified like yourself to, to talk about what you're seeing on the front line. It's been pretty invaluable. Um, I, uh, I'm also having some coffee ground in the background. There you go. Get that blender going. going on. <laughs> Getting ready um, for the morning. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. It's the bedtime over here. So, um, no, I really appreciate it, you guys. This was this is an awesome thing. I think uh, you guys are just gonna have a lot of fun and and come across a lot of really cool people for for you know any kind of cause. So I'm I'm really really excited to be a part of this. You guys, I'll tune in to every one of them. Uh, oh, thanks, Sam. And rem it. remind our audience one more time what are the, what the causes are we're driving to. It's uh, I know you had mentioned the Notre Dame Club locally by you, but what else? What else are we are we yeah. up some supers on? Yeah, and you know, as a member of the Oregon Clinic, we I try to throw them out there. We we do a lot of good things to the community and try to try to get our our, our presence felt. And uh, Providence Medical System, system which is um, you know a huge health system out here in the Pacific Northwest and in Oregon. Um, and then you know, I know I know the Notre Dame Club in Portland does a lot of really cool stuff. I know St. Francis Dining uh, Hall is kind of where they do a lot of their service stuff, and they have a regular thing there. And uh, they're a really active group, uh, Indy Club of Portland. I, I should have got one of the guys to kind of pop on here last minute uh, to tell you what they <clears> – I don't know if they have their own concerted efforts for all this stuff, but uh, they're, they're really active in the community. And uh, we have a part of the show, the last segment, it's called Over Under. And, uh, um, you know, normally we go with household items, whether it be toilet paper, paper towel, essential needs. Yeah. But seeing as you have the plethora of Notre Dame paraphernalia back there, I want to steer towards that. Notre Dame jerseys in the reserve right now. Over under five Notre Dame jerseys. <laughs> well, we saw two. We heard about a third one. I'm going to go over. Yeah, it's hard not to go over. Got to go over. Oh, way over. Yeah, yeah. Nice. <laughs> 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 I got a uh, whole, five was a yeah, modest a number. Stack of them over here. I got a bunch yeah. of number nines. Oh, I got a bunch of them. What's your ballpark count? <sighs> Maybe twenty something, thirty. That's impressive. Nice. Oh my god! You know, oh, I think I got every Shamrock Series jersey. Do you have a, do you have a, do you have a thirty five in there at all? I need one, Trevor. I need one. Bad. <laughs> I need one. I, I thought about it. I need one. I need one. I yeah. gave mine away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your most obscure player that you have in the collection? Anybody that comes to mind? Oh, uh, man. What's... Oh, I don't know. I don't have anyone that obscure. I, I mean, they're That's all right. pretty, pretty hitter. I was know? hoping he was going to bust out a Jay Smith jersey. Yeah. I, 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 haven't, I haven't thought <laughs> about Jay Smith nine. for a while. It doesn't have his name on it, but, yeah, I got, I got that. What I really nice. want, Miles Boykin. Uh, uh, nice. <laughs> a blue one so I can put the Citrus Bowl patch on it, and if he can sign it. There you go. That game was a turnaround game for us. Yes. You know, oh, yeah. That, yes. catch, oh, yeah. that catch led to bigger things. Yes. Uh, and so I, I want to get that jersey yep. somewhere uh, in, my, in my repertoire. Yeah, uh, good point. We'll make it happen. We'll reach out to Miles. Don't yeah. let me get near that golden tape, man. I'll take that thing. <laughs> I, I owe him a hug for, for jumping in the MSU band. That, that, oh, was, yes. that was the greatest <laughs> celebration moment. He, That's he, one of my favorite moments. Of he was the number football. one when he did that. He, yeah. when, he, when he did that, I, I almost had that like tattooed as the yeah. on my arm. That would be an awesome tattoo. That would be pretty yeah. great. Like the, the whole, just like that as the, the band scattered. <laughs> yep. Oh man, he's definitely a fan favorite for sure. I for love sure. I love watching him play to this day. That, it's, sure. that dude is so underrated. I mean, he leads the oh, league man. in yak every year and yeah. never. Yep. He never gets any credit. Anyway, on that note, we'll yeah. leave you. Thank you, Chuck Gabbard, gastroenterologist up in Portland with some good info, good friend of the show, good friend of ours. Um, we're here. If we can help, you know, if anything comes up cause-wise, you know, if you – anything that makes you think of us, please reach out. We're happy to help. We want to connect people. We want to unify the family. We want to support people that are out there on the front line supporting us. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, appreciate sounds good, guys. Thanks so much. You guys rock. Good time, yeah. Appreciate awesome, you, bud. Thank you. Talk to you soon. All right, later. Go, later. Irish. Go Irish. Go Irish. Go Irish.